All right, thanks everyone for coming out this evening. I always have the microphone because so many times we come to meetings and people don't hear everything that's being said. So we try to make it as clearly as possible. And when you have questions, I'll be happy to pass the mic on over to you. I'm Ian Borgard, I'm the Ward 5 City Councilor, 774-297-4939, or A. Beauregard, B-E-A-U-R-E-G-A-R-D, at cobma.us, okay? So tonight I have a different um, format here, a few things going on. So I have two speakers. So I'm going to have uh, Ron come up here. Ron is from actually Pembroke, but he is downtown Brockton, generally speaking, five days a week, able to assist you, no, four days a week, forgive me, and able to assist individuals with serious situations and address uh, legal matters. And this is all a free service downtown. So um, I'm going to let Ron speak for a few minutes on this. And he has a lot of handouts, et cetera. And uh, just so everyone is aware, you know, this can be done in different languages, and there's other um, opportunities, and people can also come and volunteer. So I'll let you take that over. Thanks. Thank you, Ann. Uh, as Ann said, my name is Ron Freddy. I'm with the Greater Brockton Center for Dispute Resolution, and we are located in the courthouse, uh, the district court, at 215 Main Street on the second floor. And although our office is in the court, we are not part of the court. Uh, but uh, our office is there because the court uh, needs our services. We provide free mediation services to the courts, uh, both the district court and small claims. We run a conciliation program that we provide attorneys to help uh, in the district court cases. We also do juvenile dispute resolutions in Plymouth and in Brockton, and those have to do with domestic disputes where the juvenile has been arrested. So we have a program that we have juveniles go through uh, to try to keep them out of the juvenile court system. It's, it's actually a, a diversionary program that the court has instituted. Um, we're funded by the Attorney General's Office, and we're also funded by the Massachusetts Office of Public Collaboration. Um, many people have not heard of it under that name. It used to be known as the Massachusetts Office of Dispute Resolution. And uh, that's why we're we're able to provide our services to people for free. And for those of you who aren't familiar with mediation, what mediation is, it's an opportunity for people who are having a dispute to sit down with the other party along with a neutral third party mediator uh, in an attempt to resolve their dispute instead of continuing the dispute on and keeping it out of uh, administrative forums, out of courts, out of other dispute, res dispute forums. Um, so that's what we do. We have a number of uh, different ways for people to get in touch with us. Uh, we have a website, uh, which is www.gbcdr.org, and that stands for Greater Brockton Center for Dispute Resolution, .org. So gbcdr.org, uh, we have a website that has our email addresses on it. Uh, our telephone numbers, the services and communities that we provide services to. We provide services not only to Brockton, but to 30 communities in and around the Brockton area. So we do, in addition to do a courtroom uh, mediation, we also do community mediation. And we're able to do business to business disputes, consumer to business disputes, roommate to roommate disputes, condo association disputes, a whole host of disputes, including divorce mediation and post-divorce mediation. So if you have knowledge of someone who may require our services, please keep in mind that our services are free. We do have uh, volunteer mediators that come and assist with the, the court work and the divorce and post-divorce mediation work. And uh, those people are trained. We do provide training as a 32-hour training uh, that we provide in order to become a mediator. And uh, once people are um, qualified and have gone through the training, they're, they're able to conduct mediations in the courts. Uh, the courtroom, uh, the, the court hierarchy has a rules committee, and their rules say that you need to go through a 32-hour training prior to providing courtroom mediation. 
So in addition to that, uh, we're funded by the Attorney General's Office for Consumer Mediation. And with me today, I have a lot of literature. Uh, uh, this is just a sampling of the information that we provide to consumers. There's uh, information on gift cards and how to hire a contractor and what your retail rights are as a consumer. We have landlord-tenant pamphlets. Uh, we have some information on how to go about buying a car. All of those types of things that if people are educated um, and informed, then it actually creates an environment where a dispute does not get created. So actually what we do is we do proactive work to keep disputes from happening in the first place. I do have um, some brochures for my program. I'm going to hand them out along with my business card. And also, if you are a member of an organization and you're looking for somebody to come in and speak about dispute resolution, I have some speaker cards available as well. And with that, I will ask if there are any questions. None. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Uh, I want to thank Ron again. Everyone needs to realize that this information is up here, and um, I'm hoping that uh, people, you know, realize this can this can address all sorts of issues. One of the reasons uh, Ron and I got talking is um, we hear these tragedies all the time. Some individuals take advantage of the elderly. This is a real, you know, problem with that, and uh, you know, there or if you know someone in your church struggling with something, or that you work with. Pass this information on. And it's all confidential. And let's say the individual is physically challenged. One of uh, Ron's um, associates can, or Ron himself, can you know make an appointment, go to the individual's home. And we cannot emphasize that that part enough because you hear these horror stories of elderly um, individuals that have been taken advantage of, and we really, really want to let them know that there are, how would I say, advocates for them and cannot strongly emphasize that enough. So I am now going to bring up our next speaker, and that is Dan Murphy. And uh, he is with this intersection of Center Street and Plymouth Street. I'll let you know that he also works with a, um, an engineering firm. I'll let him you know, explain all that. And he's affiliated with more than one project in this city over the years. And he also serves on the Water Commission. And I always mention to people, there are plenty of boards and commissions and uh, committees, et cetera, that you can be a part of in this city. And uh, so don't hesitate. You have a passion, an interest, a concern. You can submit a resume, letter of interest, and you know, give me a call, 774-297-4939. Be happy to help you navigate this. So often, people don't realize, you own Brockton, OK? So it's yours. So you control it. And by not participating, basically, you're letting someone else control it for you. And my advice is that it doesn't always work the way you want it to. So anyway, um, St um, Dan. I keep on calling him Steve because I know a Steve Murphy, too, that's also an engineer. So anyway, Dan, thank you. All right. Thank you, Ann, very much for the, uh, for the introduction. As Ann noted, I work for consulting firm CDM Smith, and uh, I'm also a Brockton resident for 22 years. Um, and I do participate on the Water Commission, too, as well. So. Um, as Ann mentioned, we're here to talk about the intersection of Center Street at Plymouth Street. It's a very important project for the mayor. He's been talking to Old County Planning Council for some time to, to study this and move it forward. And that's what brings us here today. Um, Old County Planning Council did a corridor study on Route 123. This was one of the intersections that was part of that. Obviously, during that intersection, during that study, they recognized that there were some clear uh, issues with this intersection. They went ahead and did a road safety audit uh, back in September, published a report in November that summarized uh, some of the deficiencies and some of the potential mitigations uh, for this intersection uh, back in November. It's available on OCPC's website uh, if you wanted to take a look at it. We'll also have another more formal, more thorough, more detailed uh, meeting on this probably sometime in February. So, But I just wanted to... Uh, give you this introduction. I appreciate Ann inviting us out to the meeting to kind of give you this little uh, introduction to the project, 
give the opportunity to, uh, to see what some of the concerns are, and then hear from some of you to see if you've got other observations that maybe you've made as you've passed through this intersection. So let's take a look. This is a, uh, a high-level aerial photograph of the project area. You can see that uh, Plymouth Street runs north-south, the vertical road in the, in the photograph, and Center Street runs east-west, the horizontal. You've got the, um, the bat terminal and garage over here in the upper left corner. You've got uh, a couple of commercial properties. You've got the Salvation Army over here in this corner and the Crescent Court development over in this corner, uh, the southeast, southwest corner, if you will. And um, the, the intersection, of course, is uh, the subject at hand. There's a small bridge that runs over Trout Brook just east of the intersection, too, that will be one of the restrictions that we up against in looking at the project. Taking a little closer look, Plymouth Street on the north approach on the east approach and on the south approach, they're both two lanes, uh, one lane in entering the intersection and one lane departing the intersection. Center Street on the west approach is a four-lane section, two lanes departing the intersection, two lanes entering the intersection, one that provides a right turn only onto Plymouth Street and one that is a shared through and left onto Plymouth Street. And the reason the intersection is, uh, is being looked at is, you know, if you've been through the intersection, you realize it's difficult to get through, it's, it's dangerous. It is included on MassDOT's top 200 intersections, top 200 most dangerous intersections list from 2012. Um, and the area west in the four lane section is also in the top 5% crash cluster uh, list of MassDOT as well. So it's got a, a crash rate, if you will. It's the way that we measure the number of crashes through an intersection. The, uh, it's the number of crashes per million entering vehicles. It's got a much higher crash rate than the average intersection, according to MassDOT's figures. So we got together and did this road safety audit. Old Colony Planning Council uh, led this road safety audit. And it was participated in by uh, you know, the various departments, fire, police, the school system was, uh, a representative of the school department was there. Uh, obviously, BAT was there. Um, MassDOT was there. And um, the DPW was present as well, and, and others. And if you look at it, this is a, a photograph of the intersection looking east from near the, uh, the BAT center. And you can see the four-lane section. You can see the right turn lane onto Plymouth Street. You can see the arrow markings in the lane. And one of the things you'll see is vehicles park a little more closely to the intersection than they probably should. And uh, that can get out of the way of, of sight distance and turning on that intersection. So I'm just going to kind of go through the, the photographs of the intersection. Then we'll go through a list of some of the deficiencies. This is from the intersection looking east on Center Street. You can see the bridge over Trout Brook that I mentioned. Two lane section, one lane each direction. Decent shoulders. Sidewalks are in fair shape. This is a view looking west from that bridge, back toward the intersection to the four-lane section and down toward the, the bat center beyond. And you can see that there's a, a flashing beacon over the intersection. Center street gets a yellow indication. Side streets get red indication. So they are supposed to stop. We've got crosswalks, but the pedestrian ramps are not, are not up to uh, ADA standards, so that's an improvement that would need to be made. And then this is looking north on Plymouth Street toward the intersection. Again, you can see the, uh, the stop control, the one lane each direction here in this section. Looking south on Plymouth Street toward the intersection, again, from the north here in a two lane section, one lane entering, one lane departing. And you can see how vehicles are stacking up trying to find their way into the intersection through the center street through traffic, which doesn't stop. And you can kind of see here the pedestrian ramps that uh, aren't necessarily up to code. They don't have the detectable warning panels. They don't have the level area at the top. So there are some deficiencies in the ADA accessibility through the intersection. So as part of their road safety audit, Old Colony Planning Council did a crash analysis where they take the crash records from the past three years, or the, the most recent three years of accident data, 
and I believe this was 2013, 14, and 15 that these were based on. There were 35 crashes reported in the intersection, and 27 of those 35 crashes, or 77 percent, were angle, angle crashes. Four of them were side swipes. Three were single vehicle, where they ran into something alongside of the road, be it a utility pole or, or other. One was a rear end collision, and one actually involved a pedestrian. So you can see the most frequent accident type is the angle type, which is common when you've got through traffic that doesn't stop and you've got side street traffic that queues up trying to find that gap in traffic. Um, during the peak hours, the side street traffic experiences a level of service F, which on a scale of A to F is pretty bad and it's considered a, a forced condition. So the side street traffic, they wait long enough to the point where they're ready to take uh, any gap they can find, whether or not it's the safest one to take. So they can kind of lead to some of these angle type crashes. Uh, in a number of them, southbound traffic on Plymouth Street just failed to yield to the through traffic on Center Street. So, some of the issues that were identified by the road safety audit team included sight distance and visibility. The foliage, the, the brush, the trees along the Trout Brook, some of that brush is in the way of seeing traffic that comes toward the intersection if you're on one of the side streets. Uh, the high number of angle crashes were obviously an observation. Some cars are parking too close to the intersection. So if you're on Plymouth Street south of the intersection and you're trying to look over toward downtown to see what traffic is coming towards you, you can't necessarily see them if there's a, parking, a parked car parked too close to the intersection. You can't see beyond that parked car. Driver confusion, um, sign and pavement marking placement. Uh, there are a couple of signs that might have been placed a little bit better to be a little more clear as to their intention, and there are some signs that could be added in order to clarify the way the intersection operates. Drainage was a potential concern. There were some areas that might pond. There might be some sheeting across the road and some, some areas that don't necessarily drain properly, which could cause freezing, um, and that could be a problem. Speed was an issue. Center street traffic moves pretty quick. Bicycle, pedestrian safety, and accessibility. Uh, while there are some wide shoulders there, there aren't necessarily adequate bike lanes. Um, so that's an improvement that we'd be looking to make in the project. Pedestrian safety, again, the ADA accessibility on the corners. Um, the south approach, actually, let me see if this next slide. Yes, you can see that some of these crosswalks are really quite long, particularly the one west of the intersection and the one crossing Plymouth Street north of the intersection. So we would look for ways to narrow down that pavement potentially in order to make that crossing shorter in addition to adding the ADA compliant pedestrian ramps. And congestion. Um, during the peak hours, there's a lot of traffic trying to use Plymouth Street, trying to cross Center Street, and a lot of traffic on Center Street that keeps the traffic from the side streets from getting through that intersection. So those are the things that the road safety audit identified as potential concerns and uh, observations. And as the project progresses, those are the things that we'll be looking to mitigate and looking to improve. So we wanted to take this opportunity to just kind of introduce the public to the project. Uh, again, there'll be a, another, pro another meeting uh, probably in February in more detail and more formal. Uh, but we wanted to hear from you if any of the public has any thoughts or comments, any observations that you've made on the intersection. Yes. Okay. Yes, very good point. Very good point. I talked about potential issues. I talked about some of the safety concerns. The project is uh, it's a project through the Transportation Improvement Program for the Mass DOT, and it would be um, a reconstruction of the intersection. And the way it would work and the way we intend for it to happen is that the city would pay for design of the intersection through their Chapter 90 funding, which is what the city gets from the state in order to pay for roadway improvements, design, and uh, various roadway responsibilities. And then once designed, MassDOT would pay for construction uh, through their TIP funding that OCPC uh, manages. Old Colony Planning Council is a municipal planning organization. And each region throughout the state has a municipal planning organization. 
that regulates their share of the tip money, if you will. So they, that region gets a share in order to divide it up amongst its communities in order to pay for these construction projects that MassDOT would oversee. Um, so this is one of those projects that we're looking to get designed, to get it onto the tip so that the state can reconstruct it and make the improvements necessary to, uh, to fix the intersection. The, um, the road safety audit also identified some short-term improvements that may be made in the interim. You know, some of the issues like fixing and moving signs, some of the striping improvements, some of those things can be done short-term. So the, the city will look at some of those as well to try to make the short-term improvements. Yes? That'll be one of the primary considerations. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the likely result will be a, a traffic signal. They'll also give consideration to a roundabout, but because of the Trout Brook and its proximity and the bridge, you know, there's some space concerns so that, you know, we're not sure if that, that concept will shake out, but uh, the likely result would be a signalization. It may mean reducing the four-lane section west of the intersection to a two-lane section. Um, so those are the things that we will we'll study and investigate as the design progresses. Yes, in the back row. Yes. Yeah, so you're saying coming down Plymouth Street on the south and then taking a right toward downtown, toward Commercial Street? Yeah, you've got to come out and then move forward because of the, the trees and things that are there? Yeah. Good point. Any other questions, comments? It can take that long. It is a process. And one of the reasons that this intersection is moving forward, um, I spoke of the TIP, and the TIP is typically a four-year plan, and they put together the TIP to fund projects from, right now they're working on the 2019 to 2022 plan. And um, Old Colony Planning Council gets in the neighborhood of, of six or seven million dollars for the communities that make up Old Colony Planning Council region. Um, 
And usually they take whatever projects are ready and advanced in design and fill the spots in the tip to identify which project will be funded each calendar year. And oftentimes a project won't advance as quickly as expected or they'll, they'll, they'll need a project that's a, a smaller project to fill a funding spot. So this project, if we can get it up and on the road in, in design quickly enough, you know, could happen sooner than four years out if a gap opens up and they're able to toss that in there where there's available funding. So. This would be year one, yeah. Yep, this would, this would be the start. Start the clock. Improved lighting would be a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Geometrically, the, you know, the curbs and things need to be realigned in order to shorten up some of those crossings and, and make those safer, and um, just a, a lot of different things that you'd look at. Yes. <laughs> I think we all do. Yes. It may have been the bridge. I think that was reconstructed in the late 90s. No? It was, it was probably the bridge. So yeah, keep an eye out. Uh, I'm sure Ann will let you know as the meetings are scheduled moving forward so that you'll have more opportunity to provide input and see concepts as they're developed. Um, so we look forward to, to working with everybody. Okay, thanks again, Dan, for coming by. Appreciate it. So Dan it comes you know, from the two aspects. He lives in the community and he's oftentimes working in the community. And again, he's one, a member of a board in the community. And what I want to emphasize here with all this is your input is vital all the time. So D Dan's left some information here, and he's working with Old Colony Planning Council. If those of you don't know, it's the building is right next to the Metro South Chamber of Commerce across the street from City Hall, right on here on School Street, so we could all walk down there if we felt like it right now. And... Um, of course, no one would be there. But what, what's very important, important about this is this old colony planning council has been around for 50 years to meet the needs of this region because 50 years ago, this region began growing by leaps and bounds, and a lot of the infrastructure was not at all prepared for it. And oftentimes, we wonder why we're going through these frustrating intersections or not going through them and being backed up in traffic for a long time. My, my big reason for highlighting this tonight, and again, as, as Dan mentioned, there will be other open sessions for people to attend. Anyone can attend them. Usually one's held at the Broughton Main Library in one of the conference rooms. Then they'll, they'll be you know, an, at another opportunity. Because part of all this is this is your tax dollars at the federal level being transferred down to the state level, being transferred down to the region to turn around and improve uh, the infrastructure in this community, in the communities. I mean, I'll cite a, a section that I th believe our well, Old Colony Planning Council worked very hard on, and I am very grateful that they worked on it, and that's the intersection of 28 and 106 in West Bridgewater, and that, that's improved dramatically and really moves things along quite well, and that's an example of how long it takes and uh, how you have to include everyone in the dialogue. And again, 
Over the summer, I had so many bus drivers telling me, you've got to do something about that intersection. We're so afraid with the kids in the school bus that there's going to be you know, a serious accident. So uh, all this is appreciated. All this information is provided. And once again, you know, just give me a call, 774-297-4939, and I can provide you with more information. OK, and everyone, before you leave, do not forget to sign up because we want to keep you connected with everything else that's going on. So. Uh, the next thing on this agenda is elected officials in attendance. One of them is our state rep, Michelle Dubois, so she's going to come down here and say hi. Okay, yes, jump over the seats now. And uh, also in attendance is our new Ward 4 city councilor, Susan DeCastro, who's also going to say a couple of words. So anyway, I'll, I'll pass on the microphone to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I did not know I was going to be speaking this evening, so excuse my casual attire. Um, we did have a lot of, we, had, we didn't have a lot of snow today, but we had some. Um, I am your state representative if you live in precinct B, C, or D in Ward 5, so thank you, Anne. Council Beauregard for hosting this meeting and allowing me to say a couple words. Um, we are going into the second year of a two-year term up at the State House, and right now uh, my main priority is getting some of my bills that are in committee to be referred out favorably, because if they are not referred out favorably by February, I want to say it's 17th, um, they die in committee. So I'm having a lot of meetings with chairs of committees to ask them to move my bills out favorably. One of my main bills is um, the Environmental Justice Act, which requires um, state, every single secretariat, from education to economic development to environment and energy, um, and there are many others, to look at environmental justice when they're doing permitting how and how that affects um, our population of people. So environmental justice to me and for many other people is the little red inhaler that everybody or a lot of people in urban communities have to carry around because our air is so toxic to our little lungs to breathe and we see that a lot with children that have severe asthma hospitalization rates here in Brockton. Um, environmental justice is defined by a certain percentage of the population who are either low income or people of color or people that have English as a second language or people that have lower education attainment levels. Science, well, analysis has shown that people that live in communities just with those percentages wind up having more toxic facilities living around them. So you may not fall into that category that I just defined, but you're living here in Brockton and um, research has shown that we have worse health outcomes than other people living in more affluent, educated, wider communities, which is all unfair and unjust. So the Environmental Justice Act seeks to make our environment as clean as environments everywhere across the Commonwealth. And a lot of people have been denying this factor, though it's almost impossible to deny anymore. Um, BU just came out with a, a report last week that showed overall Massachusetts air is becoming much cleaner. However, air in urban communities is becoming dirtier. And so the reason that they're citing for this is there's a big state push um, to have more electric vehicles on the road, which means a lot of people are using less um, fuel, which is less uh, pollution in the air. However, I mean, you can look at your neighbors or look at yourself. I know for me, it's, I can look at myself and say that even if the state is subsidizing my ability to buy an electric vehicle, which is like 25,000 to 35,000 and up, even if the state is subsidizing $7,000 of that cost, I can never afford that. My neighbors can't afford that. So what, what we're seeing is over across the state, the state subsidizing, I consider it affluent people to get electric vehicles is having some positive effects for air, but it is not having those same positive effects in urban communities who are already bearing a higher burden with um, negative health outcomes because of not just air, but there's water. There are a whole bunch of different aspects to what influences our, our environmentally our more negative outcomes because, you know, we're just, we're very fragile as human beings. And science knows the cocktail that how much a human can actually um, take in 
before our bodies start reacting in a negative way. So environmental justice seeks to have every single agency look at the community at, from that perspective and provide them more information sooner, more time to respond, because another issue of environmental justice is when you live in a very affluent community and someone wants to bring a tire burning facility there, which they never want to bring tire burning facilities there, but if someone wanted to, you would have a lawyer and an engineer and an architect and a banker and a lot of people who are at this level of um, education that's right on target to be able to follow the bureaucratic process right through and either be able to afford to pay for that air study or the engineer to come in to make the argument that it shouldn't be placed on a drinking water supply. But in these environmental justice communities, the population of people are still just as worthy and just as um, deserving of a clean environment but they don't have that institutional knowledge within their neighborhoods to be able to fight back these polluters. So what happens is because our neighbors and myself can't um, participate in the process of the permitting, we can't um, explain to those regulators why projects are bad in a way that the regulators understand, and then they cite those dirty polluting businesses in urban communities, and so just like there's this huge movement at the state house to, and at the state level to incentivize electric car vehicles, that's one solution to climate change, one part of the solution. Environmental justice is another part of the solution. Because once we give the communities that are being over polluted the tools that they need to appropriately respond to these, you know, frack gas power plants, 350 megawatts that they want to put in in Brockton that's like right near a senior high rise, right near an elementary school, right near St. Holmes, on top of West Bridgewater's drinking water supply. Once we give the communities the power that they need and the knowledge that they need and the time that they need to stop these things, just like Newton would never have a 350 megawatt power plant proposed there, Brockton won't have a 350 megawatt power plant proposed here, and it would be proposed in a place that's more appropriate with a lot of buffer zone for the pollutants so our little children don't have to breathe them in and they don't have to drop on their head when they go to school every day, or our senior citizens don't have to breathe them in and experience more cardiac arrest because the air is so polluted, or hospitalization and potentially death because of our breathing issues. So. That's one of my big bills. I've, I had a meeting with the chair of environment, and he looked me in the eye, and he said, I am on board with environmental justice. So right now we're figuring out which form. Is it going to be a half a loaf or a full loaf? Or is it going to be like a slam dunk? Or is it going to be still a good thing, but maybe not everything we want? That's something we're working out. And then once it leaves his committee, it's a whole nother struggle once it gets to third reading. Um, but once it gets to the Senate side, it will sail right through because there's a lot of support over there for environmental justice. And before I hand it back to Ann or take any questions, two I have a lot of bills, but two other bills. I'm actually working with the chair of judiciary, who is uh, State Representative Claire Cronin from Brockton. It's a very uh, powerful committee and a very powerful position that our delegation is lucky enough to have Representative Cronin have. And one of my bills is to terminate parental rights of convicted rapists if a rape results in a child and provide a civil process for people who have experienced rape and had a baby born of that rape to be able to terminate parental rights through the civil side as well. Um, and to include gender as a protected class in our state's hate crime law. Because right now, 57, uh, 27 states include gender as a protected class in their state's hate crime law, and the federal government includes gender as a protected class in the state's hate crime law, but Massachusetts does not. Massachusetts includes gender identity, and I, when I first heard this, I thought, I identify as a woman. I am a woman, so if someone were to decide to hurt me because, or damage my property, I would be protected, but that it actually, I'm not. So gender, that's another bill that I'm working on with um, Representative uh, Cronin's office to try to get that out of committee. And we're coming up on the budget for 2018. Uh, in good news, it's in a different district, but 
ward. And good news, I have $75,000 that the governor will be writing a check for any week now to finish McKinley Park. They're going to put in um, a swing set with that money, and they're going to fence in the new playground that the Patriots Foundation donated. Um, and it's going to cap off another $35,000 earmark that I got for the basketball court there. And in 2018, if anyone has any ideas for what they want me to ask um, for as earmarks, in the budget, I would love to hear that from you. Um, but one of them, I'm going to be asking for $200,000 for a new play system at the Downey School. Um, and I'm trying to incorporate, because you don't get a ton of money in earmarks, but I'm trying to incorporate playgrounds in every year's budget so we can improve the playgrounds that our children and our families get to go to, which would incentivize families to live in our community, which is what we want, because when we can incentivize our, our living space to be um, uh, supportive of families, then we have safer communities. So that's where I'm going with that. I'm happy to take any questions that you'd like. My office number is 617-722-2011, 617-722-2011. And I have um, office hours every month in the whole district. So please feel free to contact me. Thank you. Anybody have questions? We good? All right. Thank you. I'm attached here. Yeah, I'm attached. Thank you. Representative Dubois is certainly busy, isn't she? Doing all this work on our behalf. My name is Susan Nicastro. <coughs> Excuse me. Still with a cold. And I am the new Ward 4 City Councilor. And I'm thrilled to be here tonight. Um, Councilor Beauregard works so hard, and she's been so generous with her time helping me learn the ropes of being a city councilor. So far, I've attended, since I was sworn in on January 1st, one city council meeting and one finance committee meeting. So I'm slowly getting myself on the road and running. Um, I, I have about a half dozen matters going right now for constituents. Um, nothing very sexy, but things that are very important, like street lights and repaving roads, and just helping some constituents with a host of, of things, a, a no parking loading zone sign. And it's a pleasure to be doing this. I'm meeting more people as time goes on. Um, and I will be having a Ward 4 City Council meeting, perhaps that will be televised or, or videotaped. Um, it's going to be sometime in March, and I'll be announcing the date and the time and the location soon. Thank you for the opportunity to address everyone. And thank you to all of you for coming out on this snowy evening. Thank you. We're going to be working on a few projects together. So anyway, again, I want to uh, mention that uh, don't hesitate to sign up, please. We'd like you to do that. And uh, tonight also, down the hall, is taking place the superintendent of our school system is having the second of her uh, community meetings to find out parents' concerns. She has a good crowd over there, and I thought it was interesting. Some parents did bring their kids, and there's actually a room where someone is taking care of the kids, and they're just having a ball in there. So I guess it worked out for everyone. That was one of the reasons why she made her meeting 6 to 8, and I made my meeting 6.30 to 8.30, because I always tell people these are generally informal. The idea is information, communication, because the goal is we're not keeping any secrets here. I mean, there might be some perception that we are, but we're not, okay? I will say sometimes people misconstrue things and get them a little confused. Again, my number is 774-297-4939. And uh, as my colleague mentioned, a lot of people have concern about street lights and signs, et cetera. So when we're talking about street lights, we're talking about the ones on the poles that <laughs> turn on automatically, generally, um, when the sun sets and uh, you know go off at a certain point. Now, we are at a time we've never been in for as long as most of us have been around, and that is that we're replacing every single one of the street lights in the city of Brockton. And we have hundreds of streets in the city of Broughton. They do, if all goes well, the company that's been contracted to do this. This is what's so wonderful about this. These lights are brighter, and they are more energy efficient. So this is great. So now, they are in the Brookfield area, right now, going up and down the streets. Repair. 
They do not do it during a blizzard. Want to clear that up right now. So <laughs> one, one uh, day behind schedule here. And they don't do them on holidays. But Monday through Friday, they generally get 40 streets done a day. Now, there are different lights. Should you live on a street, I'll name one in my neighborhood, uh, Thomas. Then the ones you will see on Crescent Street and Center Street. Why? Because they have more of a residential hue. They want you to be able to feel safe, but at the same time, they don't want the lights blaring in your bedroom when you're trying to go to sleep, you know, at 1030 at night. So it's not that um, there aren't any residents on Crescent and Center, but the, um, the idea is both Crescent and Center, for example, because I'm citing streets that are in, on the east side of Brockton, are also state roads, Route 27 and 28. Now, you can approach us with any of your concerns, and at that point, we do not have all the answers, but our goal is certainly to help you solve your problems. And what we try to do is connect you to the right person if, in fact, working directly with us is not going to be the solution. I did want to point out that we have another state rep in the, in the city of Broughton for Ward 5, and this is uh, Precinct A, which includes, uh, what, what do I want to say, um, downtown Broughton, um, this side of Main Street, and um, let's see, streets like Kingman and uh, as I go, I go further down here, um, Otis and uh, Lawrence. And anyway, that's uh, Precinct A. And the state rep is Jerry Cassidy. And I, I don't um, know if he could have made it here this evening. Also, our state senator is always available to us. Uh, state Senator Mike Brady, he's no stranger. He's been involved with the city since he ran for school committee back in, I believe it was the late 80s, early 90s, his first time that he said he started off embarking on this. Okay. We have the fourth largest school system in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And later on, our um, school committee person, Judy Sullivan, who is now down the hall, uh, helping parents and teachers and concerned individuals address certain circumstances, will come by. We have our business cards here. If you have concerns, call us. Like I say, sometimes right away we can connect you to someone. Sometimes we have to do some research. I have one situation where I made over 17 calls to get the information I need. And there are times they're like, what was I thinking <laughs> when I signed on to this? But you know, you're just so relieved when it's such a successful endeavor. So um, I wanted um, to, um, you know, I'm going to flip this around a little bit. I wanted to come up with some upcoming concerns just so people realize this. I cannot emphasize enough how you are welcome to attend any meeting in this city. Finance committee, city council, we have a little disruption, everyone knows, in city hall, our elevator is not working, and it's going to need to be replaced. And this is quite the endeavor. And since this is your money, they don't just walk up to anyone and say, oh, why don't you do this? It goes through a process, an involved process, and anyone can find the documentation on this. It's all public record, okay? And why I emphasize this is that's why it takes a little bit longer. Because if you choose to, for example, uh, seal your driveway, you do not have to go through the production that the city would to put, seal, let's say, a parking lot. Because the information needs to be known to the public, and we need to have a reputable individual doing all this. And again, so that takes uh, a series of steps. So I just cited something a little bit um, over, you know, simplification. I do want to emphasize now that we are a new city council. We also have a couple more city councilors. Uh, Councilor um, at large, Wynn Farrell, was unable to attend this evening because he has illness in the family. And uh, he just let me know uh, late this afternoon. So uh, I just wanted to you know, mention that. But he is available if people have concerns on, on issues. I mean, I try to be as available as possible. Really, the best one is 774-297-4939. And the best thing to do is leave me your name and number. I get a lot of people to call, and don't give me any of that. And, uh, so I'm really trying to get back to everyone. I cannot emphasize that enough. And sometimes it's easier than other times. I mean, if you have a concern and you, need, you say, oh, you can call me anytime, please let us know that. 
If you, you know, you don't want me calling after 8 o'clock, that's fine, too. So I believe somebody has a question here. Yes? Four weeks. Now, again, I told you, we have never been here before where they are replacing every single light in the city. So what they've tried to do is get to all those lights. In a couple of circumstances, they've gone out on a separate, how would I say, quote, trip, end quote, to do that. But it is more complicated to do that than it is to do 40 streets in the course of one day. So no one is being forgotten, and we always follow up with um, your questions and concerns. No one is getting up in the morning saying, we're not going to attend to this. Everyone wants to attend to it, and I will say sometimes there, there are some challenges. Some of these polls, some of these other situations have been seriously neglected, sometimes vandalized, so it, get, it could be a little bit more complicated. Again, I don't have all the answers, and at no time is there this uh, desire not to address uh, someone's concern. I realize it's frustrating. I have someone else on a dead end street that wants hers also, but they haven't come to that area. So I keep on following up and I keep a running list and I call the director of um, public, Department of Public Works and he's very, very helpful, responds to us immediately, which is wonderful. And uh, we're not forgetting about you, I assure you. And I will say, um, if we have better weather, things go along a little bit more smoothly, so we're not forgotten. Another thing that I want to mention is some upcoming things that are going on. Like I mentioned, that the elevator is going to be replaced. It will not be tomorrow. It's going to be a little bit of a time-consuming situation. But now having said that, if you come to City Hall and you needed to go up to the, f the third floor, and you cannot make it up there, they will come down to you. Okay, and so don't don't go to you know um, and and get all concerned that you have to go up nine flights of stairs because you don't. Okay, someone will come and service you. Okay, now sometimes things can be a little bit more complicated. I have someone that wants to know um, about, for example, flood plains, and really that's a federal jurisdiction, but we have some information in the city that we can assist this individual. So we try to respond to individuals, and, and yes, we are the traditional 8.30 to 4.30, Monday through Friday. And again, we, we try to make, you know, how would I say, opportunities for people. So while I'm up here, and since uh, Representative Dubois is here, and um, City Councilor Ward 4, Susan Castro is here, I want to mention, if you have certain concerns, certain frustrations that you wish to have, let's say, a meeting on, please notify us. Because this is, I mean, in this case, um, both, um, I'm, I'm sorry, Dan Murphy and um, Old Colleen Planning Council asked me to have this meeting for the beginning of input. And I spun it off in January, which normally I would not have a meeting in January, purposely because I wanted us to get in the pipeline, um, which has the funding, and I know that the director who's been with Old Colony Planning Council for 40 years now, lives here in Broughton. We can walk to his house, too. I'm sure he'd love to see us. And um, he, he is going to present his concerns in a couple of weeks in front of, uh, no, actually, yeah, it, it is a couple of weeks from today, actually. And um, so he has his list. And remember, there'll be other regions asking for their, their money, too. So, you know, always going after the dollar because, let's face it, everything that we want seems to cost money and uh, more and more as we go along. The two, situ the three situations we come up with here the most are traffic issues. Everyone is invited to a traffic commission meeting. The reason I'm bringing this up is because for the first time in many years, the traffic commission has moved to a much more convenient location. They are going to be meeting in the water department. And you ask why. Well, first of all, because there's more parking. It's on one level. And it, it's, it's, it's very organized, simple, and it's a great setup. And so this is great for individuals that are physically challenged, et cetera. And you know what's really nice, too? You're not coming into a police station like many people were to address a concern 
for the traffic commission and going by somebody that might have just been arrested, that there will be no one <laughs> in the water department that has um, experienced something of this nature. So you will be, again, anyone is welcome to come and address their concerns, okay? The next meeting, unless there's um, will be on Thursday, January 25th at 7 o'clock. And again, uh, if you have any concerns, please join us, okay? And express your concerns. They matter. And like I said, sometimes it, it's clean and simple, and other times it's, it's literally unbelievable what the, um, how would I say, the complications and steps one needs to take. And uh, those were two issues that I really wanted to highlight. I also wanted to mention, because people don't realize this, we are the governing body of the city of Brockton, okay? And we oversee, or, or try to, situations to make it better for all of you. So by having as much communication as possible, we can move forward with this. So the reason, again, I emphasize this is we also have subcommittees. And we have an accounts one, so we watch where your money's going. Anytime you're welcome to these, they're always posted on the city's website. You can call me if you're curious. We have one on real estate, because people don't realize that the city owns property, besides the school we're in right now, and uh, that there's information available on all this. Also, we have a subcommittee, and this one gets a little confusing. It's called ordinance, but actually it's a, that's what makes the laws for this city. And anyone is more than welcome to attend any of those, okay? And uh, the last one is public safety. This one's very interesting, too, because it has to do sometimes with, again, law issues, which was interesting because what has come up in front of us is, of course, how uh, the legalization of marijuana in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts recreational. And uh, so, again, we're still in the planning stages with that because the state has just come forward with their new commission. And... Many times, actually, this public safety meeting covers auto repair and garage repair licenses. So I found that one interesting. All the time, these are public meetings. You can speak at them, they're public hearings, express your concerns, or you know, interact with individuals. So I just want to make that clear that you own this. So the more you participate, the better the community can be for all of you. I'm not saying it's going to go, it's always going to be smooth sailing because that would be deceptive. And um, again, but we want your input. I'm trying to be as, I mean, everyone uses that term transparent. I'm just going to be upfront with you and give you the facts, and then you can think about things yourself. Okay. So now, having said that, there's plenty of information available on concerns and ideas and um, situations that pop up. So now I'm going to. Um, Go back here for a moment, and like I said, I mentioned the upcoming concerns because for a lot of people, they need to go to City Hall, and yes, we're really, this is one of these things that should have been addressed years ago with the elevator, and it's a shame that it's really causing so many complications. But in the interim, we will do anything we can to help and assist individuals, okay? And if there are concerns um, from um, a nightclub being, you know, how would I say it, too loud after two in the morning, Call us, give us the information on it, and we'll follow through with it. And you have your turn to speak, because that's very validating. And I just, I cannot emphasize that enough. And we are listening. And uh, it, sometimes it, it, might, it might seem like we're handling a whole lot here. So now what I wanted to do was uh, talk to you an update about the Thatcher Street project. For many, many people in this city, they do not want more affordable housing. You are pleased to know that fortunately for us, the Secretary of Housing and Economic Development that was here in Brockton today made it clear that he has no intentions of bringing more affordable housing to downtown Brockton. Well, naturally, I was very happy to hear that. He believes that Brockton is more prepared for market rate housing, so I was happy to hear that. But we discussed commercial economic development, and we're very pleased to hear that there is some thought to that, which is really great for those of you that are residential taxpayers, because that means you get to share the burden with more economic um, 
and successful businesses that come to Brockton. We're very interested in hearing also that there are, very, there are companies that are very excited about coming to Brockton. And again, we will let you know about this. And I cannot emphasize enough how many meetings that you can participate in if you so choose. You can just sit there back, you know, in the quiet in the back, or you can you know, have dialogue. And I want to also mention that on January 31st, once again, the weather dictates our lives at this time of the year, at 8.30 in the morning at 60 School Street is the Downtown Broughton Association meeting. You're more than welcome to join us there. We're going to have a discussion. And I know people say, oh, she's delusional. She's talking about tourism. We're not going to be a destination. I'm well aware of that. But there's no reason why we can't get some of these tourism dollars into our city to take care of the things we need, whether it's infrastructure, public safety, investing in our schools. So we'd love to um, have you, you know, come on by. You again, you're always welcome to these various meetings. I try to let people know about them as much as possible. I use the newspaper. I'm not miss, um, spend a lot of time on Facebook, but I do have people post things on Facebook for me. I also go work through the radio station WATD 95.9 FM. And the reason I'm mentioning this now is because they've been doing a documentary series. It's, it's quick on the radio during the news, you know, for example, like at 6.30 in the morning and at, five, at 6 o'clock at night. And it's all going on all this week. And if you miss it, it will be on WATD 95.9 FM's website. You'll be able to do the link. And this is all about how Broughton and other communities use Silver Lake and the Furnace um, Pond. And what's the other one I'm forgetting about? And the Halifax community and uh, why, you know, the concerns and how water is a valuable commodity and um, how we're going to need to address them as a region. So again, all this information is available to you. This documentary was done by an individual that's been involved in the radio industry, so I'm going to say for like 30 years now. So that, um, that ages him a little bit. Okay, let's say 25. No. <laughs> and again, presented this. So I'm hoping that people realize this, because I know people get their bills and say, what's happening here? Ask questions. We will provide you with the information, and remember, Always, your input's valuable here. Okay, and let me get back to the Thatcher Street project here and how it's not a done deal. So don't anybody go to bed at night thinking that they're just going to start building tomorrow because it's not going to happen. Okay, there is many steps we can take. We are still collecting names and petition signatures, and this will go on for some time now. We're not alone with our frustration in this area, which I want to emphasize. I've gotten calls from East and West Bridgewater. They weren't very excited about having more traffic. Don't understand why. But um, they also, there are other concerns that have been mentioned in, for this region. So we're asking you to um, participate at every level. If you don't want something to come to Brockton, you have the power to stop it from coming here. And uh, I, re I met Representative Dubois right before she ran for Ward 6 City Council when they did not want a trash transfer station on the border of Broughton and Avon. They mobilized, and they got their signatures, and they addressed the issue, and there is no trash transfer station there. And again, you have the power. You're not going to win every battle, but quite frankly, uh, numbers matter. And we have a lot of, uh, we have state reps paying attention to this. And the state senator is very concerned about this. So these are people that you can talk to about this concern. So uh, Gene Holmes, um, who has been, I would say, the ringleader in, in mobilizing these petitions, people can take signature sheets with them. And people can sign here tonight if they have not. And we're going to continue collecting these signatures. And we're going to have ample opportunity to have public hearings to address this issue. I would have loved to have nipped it in the bud, as they say, but it didn't go exactly like that. But uh, act not defeated, only act determined. And what's really great about this is at first people were a little afraid to speak out against it if they were holding public office. And now we have advocates in that arena at the state level that are supporting us. And it is an election year for them, <laughs> yes. And everyone, I believe, saw the article that our um, 
which I find interesting. Primary will be the day after Labor Day this year, which is pretty amazing. So kind of uh, interesting, worth noting. It's going to be a statewide election year. I hope everybody here is registered to vote. If you're not, we have voter registration cards, but you can also go online now if uh, the state has uh, your signature, which is pretty neat here. So I'm gonna continue to mention, we have many services in Brockton, serve people of all kinds of backgrounds, because remember, we're the only city in Plymouth County. I'm gonna also mention that we have much information. The city is not responsible for all the services, but the city is responsible for letting you know that these services exist and how they can help you. Um, again, I guess I'm winding down this a little bit earlier than anybody expected. And uh, I can be reached at 774-297-4939. And the reason I emphasize that is because sometimes people say, I didn't know how to get a hold of you. We're really trying here. And uh, I mean, sometimes I get a phone call and you know, I'm in the line at Walgreens or something. But uh, we try to you know, get back to you, follow up, and uh, we are, this is supposed to be a part-time job. Huh. That's a whole nother story. But um, again, feel free to call us. Feel free to ask questions. I think if I were to de describe the largest problem in the city of Broughton would be misinformation and communication. And I'll cite an example. I had someone call me and say, and this is really, wow, that they thought that um, the convent would become a homeless shelter because they heard someone that sort of works there's friend that sort of, no, nothing like that is happening. So everybody relax now, okay? And this is what we want to clear up right away. You don't need to, how would I say, acquire uh, unforeseen frustrations when they don't exist in the first place. There's enough of them out there between our weather and between our uh, traffic and between other challenges that, how would I say, come up, like increases in bills and services, et cetera. You don't need to, how would I say, perceive something negative that does not exist. So I want to clear it up now that we will be working more closely. People will be contacting you. If you have signed the petition and has given your name about future meetings, and again, if you have any other concerns, please contact us or my colleague, Susan Nicastro. And again, you know, she can be reached at snicastro at cobma.us, I at aborigad at cobma.us. And I just want to mention again that Judy Sullivan, the Ward 5 City um, School Committee, is uh, down the hall and she's here to answer questions if anyone has them. This, that meeting is also being taped. There are going to be other meetings about concerns with the whole public school systems in the city. Uh, they're beginning to take place next week. Anyone is welcome to those. And uh, again, like, feel free to take different information. I want to take, thank Ron for coming here from um, Greater Broughton Dispute Resolution and Center in downtown Broughton that's open four days a week and um, he's available for you. And I want to take, thank Dan Murphy for being here and beginning to explain this project and what it entails. I also want to take my, thank my colleague, Susan Nicastro, Ward 4 City um, Councilor, and uh, Representative uh, Michelle Dubois. So again, everybody, be safe. Thank you. And there will be more Ward 5 meetings to come that I can promise you.